Great. Well, thank you all so much. We're going to enjoy a special evening with two of the country's top young adult authors. Maureen Johnson uh, will be interviewed by Jennifer Lynn Barnes in tonight's Zoom webinar. So Maureen is the number one New York Times and USA Today best-selling authors of more than a dozen young adult, book, uh, young adult novels, including the Truly Devious series, the Shades of London series, Sweet Scarlet, and 13 Little Blue Envelopes. Her collaborative books include Ghosts of the Shadow Market with Cassandra Clare, as well as Let It Snow with John Green and Lauren Miracle, uh, which was also a hit feature film on Netflix. Maureen's books have sold more than 3 million copies worldwide and have been published in more than 30 countries. She grew up in Philadelphia, graduated from the University of Delaware, and has an MFA in writing uh, from Columbia University. She lives in New York City with her husband and her dog, and her latest book is Nine Liars. And uh, Jennifer Lynn Barnes is the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 20 acclaimed young adult novels, including the Inheritance Games trilogy, Little White Lies, Deadly Little Scandals, The Lovely and the Lost, and The Natural series. Jen is also a Fulbright scholar with advanced degrees in psych uh, psychology, psychiatry, and cognitive sciences. She received her PhD from Yale University in 2012 and was a professor of psychology and professional writing for many years. And her latest is The Final Gambit. Uh, so all uh, 250 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jennifer and Maureen for joining us here tonight. And Jennifer, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I am so excited to be here tonight with Maureen, who I've known for many, many years, uh, to talk about this book and the series that it is a part of. Um, so for my first question, and <laughs> because of course I come complete with long, long lists of questions. Maureen, are you getting some glare there? You know what? The sun, the sun, I'm here in California in a hotel room and the sun just popped up from behind a cloud. I was like, I'm going to put you in weird shadow. So hi, everyone. I'm a creepy shadow. It actually makes you look quite mysterious. <laughs> That's my goal. I like to look mysterious. I like to it's, just sort of, it just seemed like a weird shadowy figure. So I'm, I'm perfect, down with that. But, but on the topic of being mysterious, mm -hmm. I want to go back in time, way back to before mm -hmm. you wrote Truly Devious and just ask kind of what drew you to the mystery genre in the first place? I always wanted to write them because I was obsessed with mysteries as a kid. It, they're all I read, truly. Like I, it was the first book I ever read was uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles. I had a children's edition, little tiny illustrated edition. I was four years old when I got it. And I, it was my first book. And I was amazed by this guy. There was this story about this guy who was so smart. And he could tell that his friend Watson was there because he looked in the reflection on the teapot and there was the, the glowing dog and the cigar. Like, it just was like, this is amazing. I just want to solve everything. And I read every mystery that I could get my hands on from, uh, you know, when it, you're, at that age, things like um, Choose Your Own Adventure Mysteries, Encyclopedia Browns, obviously the Westing game, which I read over and over and over until I wore it out. Um, there was this amazing illustrated series of books called um, Something Queer. And it was like something queer is happening in the library, something queer is happening at school. Uh, and then just from there to every single mystery that they had on the library shelf and to Agatha Christie's A Day and word puzzles and one minute mysteries and like basically you name it. I wanted to solve it, but I didn't write mysteries for why I think for a couple of reasons um I wasn't sure that I could or if I should and I think sometimes maybe we don't do what we want to do because it seems like oh what if I get it wrong well then you know then I'll be really sad <laughs> that I disappointed myself not doing the thing I wanted I love so much I couldn't bear the thought of doing it badly and they seem really complicated. And you know what, Jen, they are. I don't know if you know this from the fact that you've written all these mysteries, but they're kind of complicated. I've got like six notebooks full of notes on the one I'm doing right now. So mm -hmm. yeah, you got to keep a lot of a lot of notes. You need to remember all, all the things you put and do all the check all the math and go back and forth, um, which 
I can see you being super, super good at because you're Dr. Jim and you have a system for, like, I just can imagine the systems, the notebooks, the, the many colors and levels and, you know, your system probably looks a lot less chaotic than my system. My system actually often involves figuring everything out in a notebook and then losing the notebook and then spending okay, like three days thinking my life is over and then finding the notebook or not great. finding the notebook and then going from there. I finally realized on this last one that I'd actually taken notes on what was in the notebook. So when I lost it, it wasn't a big deal, but that's a recent development. A lot of post-its, a lot of post-its. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess now that I've known that I didn't know mystery was like your true love forever. Yeah. Looking back a, a, across your earlier books, can you see in some of those earlier books, the arc towards mysteries? Like I'm thinking like Shades of London. Yeah. How, I mean, that, you know, that like, was my, that was my first step. Yeah. But you know, I feel like also people would tell us things people did or didn't want to read. Like there used to be a big line, like no one will read funny books. So don't <laughs> write anything funny or just stuff like that where you're like, okay, what? <laughs> huh? Okay, if you say so. Um, but I, yeah, I just avo I avoided going straight for it. But then at some point I decided to, yeah, this is funny, um, just go directly at the thing. Just run towards the, just run headfirst towards it. Like I do with doors and walls. Just like run directly at it and um, see what happens. And that's what brought us to Truly Devious. So my second question is going from that original trilogy with that mm -hmm. epic arc across the three books and that very complicated mystery. I don't even know how many post-it notes you must have had mm -hmm. across the three, but how did you make the decision to transition to standalone mysteries? That was always the plan. Um, that I was, a, I was a detective fiction reader specifically my specific niche that I really loved the most was my detectives that you know especially the idea that you could pick up the detective at any point you can pick up a Poirot and if you if you follow Poirot in order you're going to know a little bit more about him but you don't have to if you're a Lord Peter or or Sherlock or you know in this case or like recently with Benoit Blanc like it, you didn't have to see Knives Out to know that Benoit Blanc is a famous detective who likes having a case, like it doesn't matter. He makes one reference to it in Glass Onion and really there's no other reference. Um, that's not a spoiler, it's just literally like one line that's like, I've solved other mysteries. And I've always liked that about detective stories, this, this kind of idea that you can pick up a character all along the way. And if you know, say, the only one I can think of that's like a classic mystery that has, there's a lot of modern ones that probably do it, a couple that I can think of, but the classic one, is um, Dorothy L. Sayers and Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane, which were written in the 30s, 40s. And they have a romance. These two mystery solving characters have a romance that you can follow um, by following the books in order, but you can also read them randomly and it's fine. Like you just get that sometimes they're together and sometimes they're not, and it's not the end of the world. Like you'll still be able to follow the mysteries just as well and they're brilliant, so. I always wanted to write a detective. So I built a detective. I built a large thing for her to grow in, like an aquarium. <laughs> Ellingham's just an aquarium to grow a detective, as far as I'm concerned. So I needed a place to grow her. And then like, like she was my sea monkey or something. And then I was like, okay, now I send you to the world. So I'm wondering when you're referring to all these classic mysteries and even you know the more recent ones even knives out and everything do you think there's a difference when you're doing these standalones and it's a ya than if you were doing it in adult are there any additional challenges to having a character who's at a time of life when they might be changing more yeah i do also they have different levels of resources as you well know like when you have someone who's 16 you know, they're not going to be like, yeah, my ex-wife, uh, you know, like, that's just not how it is. It's, they're like, I have my very first significant other. I've had my very first heartache. Um, I'm learning to drive a car and I have no money. Or in your case, I suddenly have a lot of money or like they, it's, it's that age group. Why is usually about firsts. Yeah. Um, but a lot of detective stories, the detectives have things like, a car and 
a, a whiskey bottle and crooked blinds and a failed marriage and a, you know, a smoking, uh, you know, like they're always like that. Um, they have a lot of baggage. I think adult detectives sometimes have a lot, even Poirot, like Poirot is this very, you know, you don't think of Poirot as like a baggagey character. Poirot is a refugee from war. <laughs> like he is, uh, you know, he had this whole career in the Belgian police and it's, he's not exactly, he, he, not, he doesn't accept in the incredibly evil Kenneth Branagh action Poirot movies, which are an abomination. We need to talk to someone about him. Kenneth Branagh must be stopped. That mustache is absurd. And Poirot does not run on top of trains. Um, teenage me would have gone to battle over that, by the way. He was my first fictional crush. I was in love. No, specifically Hastings was my first fictional crush. I can't explain it either. Hastings is, a, is not smart. He's not smart. He doesn't really, he just kind of stands there. But anyway, you were asking if I had to do anything different because it's YA. I mean, different in terms of it being an episodic mystery. Because like, if you come in six months later and your right. character's 30, that six months probably doesn't matter that right. much. If you come in six months later and your character's 17, that six months might really matter a lot more. It, it's a little tighter in the sense that Oh, uh, I've kept all of these pretty close together Within, in time. Yeah. yeah, they're they're actually really from the beginning of Truly Devious to this one to the end of this one. It's only one year. Yeah, the trilogy I wrote was also one year for that same. Yeah, they. I mean, they've had a big year, but it's it's been one year. Yeah, so there's been five books that have actually the action of five books has taken place over one year, and. Um, because it will matter when, because in this book, Stevie is a transitioning, like she's a senior, her boyfriend has moved on, he's in college. All of her friends are prepping for college and she's freaking out because she is not adjusting well to that thought of having to apply for college, that there's enough, I mean, she was like, I got into Ellingham and now I have to go and apply to college. And that means selecting a future and that means passing tests. And that means everybody being split up. Um, it's terrifying. And honestly, this book, you know, oh, sorry, screaming, screaming uh, seagull outside my window, um, that some of this was written during the pandemic. Yeah. And I thought a lot about um, all of the students, so many of you out there, you know, who you were physically out of school, some of you for like a year and a half, maybe from a matter of months to a year and a half, and how weird it must have been for, say, you were in high school in freshman year, and then you were pulled out, and then you returned again, like the beginning of junior year, like what that kind of gap looks like. Um, Am I still answering your question or have I moved on? <laughs> you're inter it's interesting. I think the condensed time gap is one of the things you have to get if you're going to do one of those YA series, because eventually Stevie's not going to be a senior the, in high school anymore or freshman in college or. The pandemic thing made me think of just what, how big, of, like when, when you were saying if someone's absent for a year or six months, it doesn't matter that much if you're an adult, but there's a lot of changes that happen in a year or six months when you're in high school. Um, right. So I like I feel like with these books, even though they're standalone mysteries where you can hop in at any time, you're still maybe seeing a little more change and flux in the characters yeah. and the lives than you would um, for characters who weren't actually passing through developmental stages yeah. at the same time. Um, but now let's talk about so we've talked about mystery. We've talked about the transition to standalone mystery. So mm -hmm. now let's talk about the standalone mystery in Nine Liars specifically. What's the origin story of that? How did you decide on this case? Well, the backstory. So Stevie always saves, uh, excuse me, Stevie always solves, it's hard to say, uh, a cold case. Uh, in the Truly Devious trilogy, it was one that happened in 1936. In Box in the Woods, it was one that happened in 1978. And in this case, it's one that happened in England in 1995. And this is a my version of the classic country house mystery that I grew up reading and grew up loving. You've written a kind of, it's not a country house, but it's a house mystery. Yes. Um, Western Games is, is a house mystery. And then there were no, is the, is the country house mystery. I love that format. 
it's beloved to me. And it works for a reason because it is a closed setting. Your cast is closed, your possibilities are closed in the sense that you have a parameter, like you have a stage parameter. But at the same time, the houses themselves can be puzzles or mysteries. Uh, English country houses in particular, because they're built over so many hundreds of years, are puzzles because you know, it starts to get built in the 1300s and then it gets knocked down in the 1400s and rebuilt in the 1500s. And then for no reason at all, a doorway is blocked off or no one knows what's behind the wall or that there's a passage or whatever. So English country houses are built over hundreds of years. They contain mysteries and so many things can happen inside the walls or the gardens. I wanted to do that. So I set up my uh, conditions under which I could have Stevie go to England and then go to an English country house. Um, in this case, where a, a two axe murders occurred in 1995. Uh, but it is a straight up country house mystery because that's the dream. Uh, you're just in my happy place when you're talking about the English country houses. It makes me uh, so, so happy. So, you know, you have like, you know, the type of mystery you're having. Does that inform or change how you plot the different mysteries like is it different to plot the country house mystery uh, yeah. than say box in the woods absolutely because it's about i mean i think i always start with why not how or who but why the crime occurred and that means i have to think about you know the age and the cast of characters that you know this crime occurred the who who was there at the time? Um, the the country house mis the country house mystery means like there's questions of say access who can get there who's there can they be counted can they be numbered is it easy to get to etc. The camp setting in 1978 you know basically anybody could have gotten in um, but in the country house it's a little bit harder. I know I've I've done things I've blocked off roads and things to make it even harder so you really know who was in that house at the time. Yeah. Has your process in general changed for writing the mysteries across the five books or does your writing process look pretty similar to what it looked like in the beginning in terms oh. of actually figuring out the plot? What's a process, Jen? Like, what's <laughs> a process? Um, it's a lot of just, I, I, I get the shape of the thing in my head and then I spend a lot of time hammering it out. I think my only process with these is that I work from the inside out. I build the crime, I build all the little tiny mechanisms inside and I'm very particular about them. And then I kind of build layers out from them. So in the case of Truly Devious, I kind of built the death trap and I put it in the center and then I started building school around it. And you know, basically I build the thing and then I build things on top of it. And I spend a lot of time physically sketching out the places. Um, there's a map in this, there's a map in all of these books. And that's because I, I really think a lot about the architecture. I don't know why, it's not like I'm good at architecture, but um, this is sort of like a stage play. Like it matters where everyone's standing. It matters what everyone can see, what like the various viewpoints are, where they are in the house or on the grounds. Um, so yeah, the location, that, that matters a lot. Um, and it's interesting because in, many senses since stevie is in the present and the mysteries are in the past mm -hmm. the location is the thing that's connecting that binds the two that binds the two and there may be some changes and things that aren't but you know she can go to the spot where something happened when she's recreating it so i think it actually makes a lot of sense when you've got these like dual timeline mysteries for place to PLA such like a huge role yeah, the pro in the, within the process, it's just building from the mystery out in a very, very firm sense of place. I have to know what it looks like and draw the layout and make sure I know the physical footprint of everything so that when I move people around, I have a very clear idea how far it is in between things or how do you get from one place to another because it matters what, what happens, what can be seen, what can be heard, how quickly could a person get away, things like that. At what point in your process do you start figuring out the like individual characters who are involved in the historical mystery? Because you've got like the place, you said you know the why, and you kind of maybe have a vague idea of who's there to begin with. But then at what point does the actual like 
figuring out your list of players, if we call this a stage play, happen? Yeah, there's a big cast in this one. So I knew it was going to be 1995 in England, and it's going to be a group from Cambridge University that is a, a drama comedy group. Uh, because Cambridge University is famous for that. Like the Footlights, they, they're famous for producing comedy drama group or comedy groups, comedy sketch groups. So I knew that's who I was dealing with. Like theater people, my people. Like I, So I, I had a sense of what kind of a group it was. Um, so in the beginning, I just knew I was dealing with a comedy theater sketch group. And then I started putting them together. They started to come together pretty quickly. Um, and... I think because the, I did something with this one that I don't normally do is that I usually don't kind of map characters onto any kind of real life figures or actors, but all of the characters in the, in the 1995 story are loosely mapped onto um, English uh, actors or comedians that I like. Is. So they all have a, kind of a physical or real even if it's very loose or just in my head they all have a physical counterpart because I'm it's a subject I'm interested in I was like oh and uh, this person or that person um I usually don't cast in my head whenever people are like what's your ideal cast I'm like I have no idea I, I can't name two actors so but I, apparently I can name every single comedian in the UK so oh so you've got the idea of sort of the comedian you kind of cast them and then their characters fall out in some way of that or yeah, I just kind of knew in this case, I feel like them? I just I just kind of knew who they were going to be. Um, and, and also, you know, I it was just a time and place that was more familiar to me. So I felt like and also, you know, I was in college kind of college theater groups. So you kind of, I know the feeling of that group, of that kind of a group. So they they came these these liars and the, the nine mm -hmm. came together a little bit quicker than some of the other casts I put together. So if the characters are just coming kind of like organically or coming very quickly, you just kind of know, are there elements of the mystery that you also just know? Um, or is that more of a painstaking process? I feel like I'm building a clock or something. Like, I just feel like I'm just some weirdo that's sitting there going, <laughs> yes. Like, I, it really feels like it's very, just when you see those pictures of Victorians that have like the monocle and they're building a clock or like just putting gears together in their shed, like, and like, don't come in my shed, I'm building, I'm building my machine. Like, that's what it feels like. Like what's, it's a, it's a weird job being a writer where people are like, what is she doing? She's, she's building imaginary people, she's putting them into a dangerous situation. But yes, it's very small and painstaking. And I just, um, from the, I, I try to build an interesting how each time. This is a pretty classic axe murder, pretty much your standard classic axe murder. Um, but there's a lot of fiddly bits, little tiny clues. I want to make it solvable and make it fair, which means I, I have to get it right and make sure everything's layered incorrectly um, and that there are enough false leads, but also there's enough reasonable material in the right places. So it feels like you're kind of working with like a tweezers or not like an eyedropper or something it's very like it's very precise fiddly work do you ever put something in and then realize it changes some like anything else that you haven't put in yet but want to keep it I ask on a personal level maybe the clock being built to achieve the end I think the, the, I, I tend to work from inside out so I tend to build the clock and then build out which means that I will rigidly <laughs> I'd be like, no, <laughs> you know, why? What if you did? Oh, no, I can't do that. It'd be too, it sounds fun. But I built the machine, the wonderful machine. And so, yeah, I tend to pretty much stick with, stick with I, it. There's, there's some wiggle room, but I tend to stick with it pretty, pretty closely. How much do you generally know when you sit down at your computer and go like chapter one? Like, do you know everything at that point or nothing no. at that point? Well, I don't, I also don't write in order. Oh. <laughs> um, I don't write in order and I, 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 I build these, the mysteries are all pretty well structured. So I, I have to know, I basically have to have written a miniature version of the entire thing before the book really gets built out. So um, then I kind of move around in, in time and because I don't write in order. So I'm kind of jumping around and putting things in as I need to, which means I can jump around and put things in chapter three, chapter 16, chapter one as necessary. 
in various Scrivener files. I find this so fascinating. I have tried to write out of order and I cannot do it. Even if Actually, I'm like jumping back between point of views, I can't just write in one point of view and then cut in another one. If I'm on chapter 11, there is no choice for me but chapter 12. So this idea being able to go anywhere and do anything once you have sort of that shell of the story is so fascinating to me. I've never been able to write in order. I tried. I couldn't do it. How, how, do, you make, do, it. how do you make yourself write the parts that you're less excited to write? Oh, um, I, um, fear is a big motivating factor. Fear, fear, it's a lot of fear. And it, I think it's just fear. It may just, just be fear. It's fear and deadlines. Fear um, and the deadlines happen, so you have to go in and write those things? I tend to actually write a lot of the backstory first. Um, so all the cold case stuff will be very carefully, like that'll all be pretty much solid. Um, and I tend to find they're very easy and fun to write. Yeah. Like for some reason that it just makes, like it's very, that, those parts always flow really easily, but I have to have every single, and then I usually will kind of write bunches of those reveal to see how, like, and make sure all the end bits start to line up. So I, the end has to be well constructed so that I can then start moving back in time and get everything to, to lead up to that correctly. It's um, chaos, so Jen. If awesome. you saw it, you, you, if you saw it, you'd be like, what is this document? I'd be like, no, I find this so exciting. I am so fascinated by this process, but thinking about it, when you're talking about like the flashback stuff being set, like I always set the puzzles first. Mm. And the puzzles are easy and the puzzles are my happy place and the puzzles mm -hmm. never change. And then I have to go back and get the story around it. So maybe there's some similarities yeah. there. Yeah. And it's like puzzles are easy. I can do all of that stuff. And like, even there's like 50 puzzles, that's like two days. And then the rest of the actual of like making the people in the book people mm -hmm. is where I like struggle more. So like, in writing in general and in writing these mysteries, what's the hardest part for you? So what was the hardest part of Nine Liars? It's always, always, always romance. And it will not surprise you to know that um, I get chased around by Holly Black specifically. Um, <laughs> and so this particular romance plot um, and the things you see Stevie doing were largely based on a conversation I had with Holly Black at a lake where she slowly chased me around and was like, what if this, what, tell me about your romance in that way that Holly does where she, she coaches you through the parts that you're resistant on. Like oh, I wouldn't know. give to have Holly Black chasing me around right now. If she anyone doesn't, doesn't know this, Holly is like the most amazing, like magician at making other people's books work. You'll just be randomly at dinner and she'll be over there making someone's book work. It's remarkable. She's, she's like the, she's the house of, of, of plots, but the thing is she also loves to do it. And she, so you'll just be sitting there and then just suddenly it's like, imagine this. And then suddenly this is what you see. Hey, Hey, you want to talk about your romance plot? No, I don't want to talk about my romance plot. I'm really bad at it. Hey, let's talk about your romance plot. You want to do a board? You want to do a micro plot? You want to do it on the wall? I got my note cards. You want to go make some note cards? And then that's how it happens. And then she will chase you around the pool. Go, come here. Come here. Tell me about your romance. Um, because I didn't know what to do with Stevie and her romance because um, Stevie is reluctant and confused and bad at romance. And, um, and what I think this is maybe my favorite of her romance plots because it her She just crashes into walls all over the place in this one. And um, it made me laugh. I mean, I, I guess that ties in a little when you're thinking about like the relationship plot, the romance plot, and I am right there with you, by the way, I'm like puzzles, easy, serial killers, easy, romance, romance hard, hard. Yep. <laughs> like yep. I spend a lot of time on it. Hopefully the product is good, but I spend so much more time trying to figure that and mental bandwidth, trying to figure that and make that mm -hmm. work at the line level, at every level, than puzzles or killers or any of the other stuff that just feels 
fun. Nightmare. Still fun, but yeah. It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to make that. But like you have an extra challenge when you're writing a series and a series of standalone and that like your romance plot has to stand alone, but it's also a trajectory. Mm -hmm or at least the character's trajectory is a trajectory. So like, how does that weigh in when you're on book five? Well, I can tell you, and we're gonna talk about Holly Black again, which is good because I'm doing an event here in California with her tomorrow. So like, um, I can tell the story of like how I was at her house and it was 11 o'clock at night. And she's like, I just put on the coffee. So she's got this big old kitchen dining room table, it's huge. And she's installed at the end a roll of butcher paper. And what she did was she goes and she fills the table with a long piece of butcher paper and plunks down a container of crayons and says, let's talk about the romance arc for all the books. And then we spent like all night with this pot of coffee and these crayons and this butcher paper drawing this gigantic diagram of all the characters and like personally what's going to happen to them generally in all the book past nine liars to the next two so the major hits of like basically where they're going are all on this giant piece of paper which, which you did not off. lose right tell me oh you no have i have it i have she paper. ripped it off and i took it home and i converted it to a different chart which sits next to my desk so all of their so oh. i know what happens so I had time to kind of think about it in columns, like where all the different relationships are and um, what we're gonna find out in each particular section and where and how the intersection of the romance and the mystery will, you know, basically hit in each one. I was gonna say like how, like, is there an element of the mystery that is impacting the romance or like what's the relationship between those two different plots? Does it depend on the book? Are they just sort of interwoven based on where Stevie's at? I think it ends up being Stevie's mindset, being the detective, like where she's at in terms of how distracted she is um, or how obsessed she is or how heartbroken she is or how excited she is um, and how she, how she manages to tune people out sometimes because she's she kind of, you know, Sometimes she kind of ignores her friends or gets a little caught up in her own head and her own thoughts. Um, so it's really kind of Stevie focused because the lens is, she's the solving lens, but they all, all of her friends contribute to the solving of the mystery. She can't do it without Janelle. She can't do it without Nate. She can't do it without Vi, and She can't do it without David. She certainly can't do it without Janelle. Definitely. Um, let's see, so of that, core cast um is there any character that is harder than the other characters or any character that is just more of a joy to write than the other characters the character of nate the writer uh stevie's friend nate wrote a book that's how he got into ellingham and he wrote this book online and it became successful and they want him to write a second one and he's, that's what he's supposed to be doing with all of his time. He's supposed to be writing the second book, but he's so terrified and he doesn't want to do it that he does. Nate is always doing anything else but writing his book. And that's the joke of Nate, but it's also the real life um, adventures of most writers I know, where it's like, you're doing anything but working on your book or you're, you're or avoiding it or terrified by it. Um, and he has a new pursuit in this book that I cannot reveal, but he is doing something else instead of working on his book. Now I'm like, and what's he gonna be doing in the next book instead of- He's always doing something. Working on he's his always, book. Yeah, he's but like, he's he is like, he's like all of us. They're like, write another book. And he's like, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> You're like, oh, all he needs is a Holly Black. Yeah, he does. Maybe he'll get one. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a character named Holly to show up. <laughs> I'll just know. He, he does have a fan. He has like a eight-year-old fan in the box of the woods who keeps following him around, giving his ideas on how his book should go. That he does not like that at all. Um, let's see here. I've been hopping around my questions as the conversation has been going. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's one that I struggle with. As you're writing these mysteries and you have readers who are coming along with you, 
story mm-hmm. after story. One of the things you're doing is you are training them to be better at solving mysteries, especially because they're learning through Stevie and watching what's going on and all of that. So here's the question. Mm-hmm. As someone's read who like after someone's read the first four and they're getting that much better, how do you keep surprising them? Um, I love the idea that I'm somehow training them to solve mysteries. Because that somehow means that maybe I'm getting better at mysteries. And that means that some that at some point someone's going to ask me to solve a mystery, which is the end goal of this entire thing. It was just someone's like, there's been a murder in this mansion. We're gonna need this mystery to come solve it. And that's this has just been a long con for that to happen. So thank you all for contributing to my delusion. Um I just try to make the best, most complicated. <laughs> you know what? Not complicated. I like the solutions to be ultimately simple, but making, cause I don't, I really don't like a super fussy solution. It should be solvable. It should be clear. It should be made, make sense. The trick is to have it as out in the open as possible and, and not be visible at all. Um, that's just what I try. I mean, I think that's all we can ever do is just really try. And I, I, because I love doing it, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about it, um, just trying to put the puzzle together. Do you think about the audience at all as you're putting the puzzle together or as you're writing, or are you thinking about the mystery, like, as if it really happened? I, I think about it as if it's happening. Like, I, I think about a generalized audience, like, this, is that fair with, with someone, you know, I, I try to stick with the fair the the rules of fairness so it's you don't need to know anything too obscure um so i try to make sure like oh is that is that within the bounds of fairness that someone should know this or that um so i think about the audience in that sense but in general i'm just trying to build the thing and then everybody can come to the thing in any way that they like wherever you know from wherever they're coming from at their level at their time and as it suits them, you know? I end up thinking a lot about the fact that when you're a mystery reader, like when you're sitting there reading a mystery, um, there's a couple ways of being good at solving it. Like I'm really good at solving fictional mysteries, but I would be useless if like someone actually got murdered and trying to solve it. And I realize that's because when I'm solving the fictional mysteries, I'm often mind reading the author. So like, instead of getting inside the heads of the different people, it's like, well, that person didn't do it. They're too obvious. Right. Right. Whereas in the real world, like the obvious person, like, like, you know, his hands were covered in blood. He had motive opportunity and all this stuff. He definitely didn't do it. You're like, that's exactly the opposite of the way that that works in reality, because you're thinking, oh, the author wouldn't tell me this then, or the author wouldn't that. So I'm just wondering, like, do thoughts like that, like what they're going to be yeah. thinking about what you're thinking? Yes, that really head. does. I mean, it's like I watched Glass Onion on a plane home from England the other week. And I was trying and I was like looking around for something to write on. I was like, oh. And so I ended up writing on like the the menu, like the plane menu. I was like, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm thinking what rules the, did Ryan Johnson play by in the first one? So what, you know, what should I, yes, absolutely. And so I do kind of think, do people think that they know my moves um, a little bit, which is a weird presumption to think that I have moves that people are interested in. So it's like, does someone know my moves? I'm like, who are you talking to, Molly? I'm like, what do you think? And then you're like, can I use the fact that they think they know my moves to like, do something else, which is one of my favorite parts, because I feel in some ways when I'm doing some of these things, like they're going to think that this is what I'm doing, but this is what I'm really doing. To be honest, I do think that also Ryan Johnson did that between Knives Out and Glass Onion. I definitely think there was a... I still haven't seen Glass Onion. We've had a lot of like flu and strep and everything else around here. So I am soon, but have not seen it yet. It's Um, really, it's really good. I'm really glad that it's a classic mystery that people, he clearly loves his classic mysteries and his, like, he is right down the line. I'm right, like, he is in that wheelhouse, but I think he subverts his own 
I think he, I think he was like, I'm thinking what you're thinking about what I'm thinking. And I think he did that. Thinking back and forth. So here's another question. Will we ever get one set in an Irish castle? <laughs> so what Jen is talking about here is the fact that uh, I promised to tell the story. Um, and I may have told it in the last time that we hosted one of these, but I think it always bears telling again, is that in several, it was several years ago. I'm not exactly sure what year it was. I think it was like 2009. Really? Ish. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. We were, uh, I, there were 10 of us in a castle in Ireland. I believe was, I think, rented by Sarah Reese Brennan. Mm -hmm. I think Sarah actually ran the whole thing. Everybody said, they come to Ireland. We came to Ireland. And you can do things like that in Ireland. You can rent a castle. It was a full castle. It was a castle. And um, it was big. And it had uh, many weird enchanted animals around it, like a cat that came and adopted us and stole Cassie's Oops. grilled cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That cat came in. That cat fully stole a grilled cheese sandwich. Um, and uh, one night we went. So we didn't really go out that much because it was really in the countryside. There was only one small town. But we were like, why don't we go to the town? So we walked to the town, and there was no sidewalk. We walked basically along this road that had nowhere safe to walk along it. So we walked sort of in a ditch in the moonlight. It was like we were all walking in this ditch in the moonlight, avoiding cars is how I remember it. And we get to the town and everything is closed. Like the town is closed. And we, I was like, I hadn't seen a vegetable all week. And I was like, I found a broccoli in this like little corner store and I held it up. I was like, oh, broccoli. And I then I, yeah, I was like, oh, broccoli, I found broccoli. Um, so I put the broccoli under my arm and we we went and we found the one pub that was open and it was full of like characters from a sea shanty is the only way I could explain it. Like there was a man who came over and he like, was- Like there could have so easily been a historical murder that was mentioned yeah. at that time. Yeah, like he came over and he was like, girls sing. And he wanted us to sing and he was like <laughs> commanding us to sing. Um, so we then we walked back through the ditch along the road with the you know the broccoli and um we got back to the castle and we realized so we i think we went ahead and yeah. the people with the keys were behind us and we thought wouldn't it be funny if we got into if we were suddenly gone we were gonna scare them <laughs> if we like they couldn't find us at all and then we were mysteriously inside the castle. We jumped out and scared and scared them. But we were like, well, how do we get in? And we're like, but because it's it's locked. But there was a window that was open like this much. I'm not even kidding. It was open like this much. We're like, and we looked at Jen and who has been a gymnast and all these things. And we were like, do you think you can get through like that window? And she's like, maybe. And I swear to you, like she did this incredible like back bend and like slithered, like. I don't know how you did it. Like you got through this little, and you had, like, had to, today. <laughs> you, you had to crawl around like a lamp and like under, like go under a, it was like a very sophisticated twisty thing that you had to do. And then you let us in and then we hid. And like, as I remember it, they didn't notice. Like they yeah. were completely unsurprised. We jumped out and they were like, oh, hey. And we're like, all of that for, all for, that for nothing. Like we ran down the path and when Jen, like, defied physics and logic and slipped through a four inch crack to like break over. Had a very castle. elaborate plan as only it people was, who would one day come to write mysteries could. It was so and much work. And literally they were like, oh, hey. For nothing. It was for nothing. So, so if not an Irish castle, it, are there any hints, however vague or mysterious you can give us about where Stevie might be headed next? Um, there are two more books. Yes. Uh, she will end up back where she starts. Um, and she's going somewhere between that I can't reveal yet, but she will end up back on home turf. Ah. 
Very good. I think it is about time to check out audience questions. If you have been putting your questions in the chat, please copy them over to the Q&A section um, because that's where I'm going to be reading off some of these questions for. Um, so let's see. Ooh, here's one. Maureen, if you could bring a truly devious character back to life, who would it be? Back to life. Mm -hmm. So someone from the from any of it who mm. is not alive, but you could realive them. Uh Ellie then. Oops, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I guess by definition this ends up being yeah, that's... didn't really think that one through. Yeah, me. I didn't think it through. Uh, I just went through. By the way, that that's I was kidding. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um which character from your books do you think you'd be most likely to be friends with if you met in real life? Uh, probably Nate, who would not want to be friends with me. So, um, but not, you could not write your books together. <laughs> I think that he would just be nervous. <laughs> like, just the the vibe would just freak him out a little bit. Like, he doesn't necessarily want to be around people, which is a fact that I appreciate. It's people that it's it's what cats, you know, they always sense the, you know, the people that don't want to be around cats and that, then the cats are like, I choose you. So where do you write? Is there Anywhere, a spot in your house or a cafe or uh I have an office in my house. Uh, I have an office in our apartment and um that is usually where I'm at. I used to go out more places, but Truly, I, I'm usually just at my desk um, in my big pink. I have a pink office. It's very pink. <laughs> it's hot, it's hot pink and petal pink. It's like a lot of pink. I'm shocked at how pink my office is sometimes. Um, yeah, but it's usually just at my desk. I mean, especially with, I was in, especially with the, the pandemic, I really even got more into the idea of just writing at home. And only recently did I go out and sit in a coffee shop and write for even like an hour once. And I was like, this is wild. What is this? Looks like you bring your computer outside your house. Like this is, who, how, what is this? Is someone, yeah, I, don't, I just don't do it that often anymore. It really freaks me out. I write mostly at home, but rarely at my desk. Like oh, I have, yeah. I, I do my bed a lot. If my brother got me like a bed desk for Christmas and I also have a bath desk that fits across a bathtub. I have a, I built myself like a bath desk. Yeah. Okay. Is there like, is this like an actual product you can buy or did you make it? No, it's an actual product. I mean, it's okay. just like this big wooden thing that goes across and has a couple different platforms and stuff, but yeah. I, because, I of, the, <laughs> because of the shape of our tub, I couldn't get anything that oh. kind of, so I had to find like, I found like a shelf that like people can sit on it. It's like a, from a medical supply company. So I got that. <laughs> But the thing is like, like I'm down here and it's up here. So it's like trying to write like that. It's very weird um, angle wise. So it's like, I'm trying to write above my head. Um, um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, have you ever put a scene in a book that happened to you in real life? Yes. I inspired by. I have. I've done it a couple of times. And I can't even remember all of them because they're they're scattered in all over the place. Little tiny, little tiny ones. Not usually not like a full one, but like little bits of things will, will turn up. I feel like everybody, I'm sure you do that too sometimes, like just little. Little bits of things. There's one series I wrote that involved debutantes. And a lot of that did come straight from the year my mom asked me to do a debutante ball. And there was like a whole year of events. And she like That's saved all the stuff. And then I didn't have to do like any world building. It was just there. <laughs> it was actually really nice. But other than that, not like you, it's mostly little bits. That's so fancy. I forgot you were also a debutante. Yes. My mom's the best mom in the world. And she asked. So I had to, <laughs> had to say yes. Um, so here's someone who is saying, what does a plotting map for you look like? Is it a template? Is it like it's just is it the post-its is it a document or shell is it like what is that other than like we know the romance map looks like a giant sheet of of butcher paper but in terms of mapping out the plot what does that look like in its various stages well it's gotten an exciting new angle in the last couple of books because it used to be whiteboards post-its 
I have a whiteboard, I have various bulletin boards, I love a post-it, um, but my husband makes video games. He is a video game producer and they have to do a lot of storyboarding and often like project management stuff. And so he uses this thing called Miro, which is just like an online like mapping software. And when I was broken, like these last two books, when I get to that point where I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I take all of my jumble of posted and I've usually written a lot by that point. And I just, things aren't quite lining up and it's usually a timing question because I have to, I wanna make sure the events are in the correct time sequence day wise. So I drag all my stuff into the living room and then I'm, he sits with me and he, he's very generous to do this. He inputs it all into Miro, which is like basically little stickies. And then he'll ask like, what kind of question we're trying to answer or like, and, and basically I walk around the room like Columbo, like, ah, and then this happens. And then it's, well, that's this, and that's it. Don't write that down. But then that's a question of that. And then that's actually a character point. And that's not a character point. And that's a thing I have to build in later. And that's actually related to, and I have all these different levels of thought and he just sits there and kind of transcribes it. And then he's like, okay. And then we build a map in Miro with like these post-its. And then I sit there and kind of scream and have panic attacks because this level of breaking it down is really nerve wracking. And it usually takes three to four, maybe five days. By the end of it, in the case of the Box of Woods, I had this long, I went to, I had to get it printed out at FedEx or Kinko's or something. Cause it was this long color, multi-page long printout that had multicolored squares for the different beats, like, like the mystery one beat, mystery two beat, romance beat, something beat, something beat. And then the schedule of days, like it, cause I usually know exactly which day one, day two, day three, whatever. And then I had just this giant chart, which I then taped up and stuck to my wall. So recently in the last two books, they have been actually transformed into an online Miro uh, post-it board and then printed out. Oh, wow. Fancy. And it's invo- <laughs> it, it's really nerve wracking. It makes me a- answer all the hard questions. And I just kind of pull out my hair and scream and go, I don't know what goes on day six. And that's the only way that day six gets fixed. One must stare d- day six in the face. <laughs> Meanwhile, I know what day it is because the copy editors make a giant list and then they're like, day four, question mark. <laughs> I am. And th- no matter I'm, what, like as hard as you work, you'll, they'll still be like, sorry, she was, she's riding a unicycle in this scene. And I'm like, oh, oh I, did ju- I, I did just pass through a book where I was like, these characters haven't slept in like 300 pages. That's where like, <laughs> it's still the same day. I'm like, I probably need to fix that. Uh, when you're doing this whole process of mapping out all of it, um, another question the audience had is how do you balance the character development against the plot demands of the mystery format? Oh, I le- I lead with plot and then I I bend the characters to the circumstance in the same way that our, you know, we are bent to life circumstance. You know, I, I make them deal with what comes up. And then, in, you know, obviously you, you, you change the order of events in order to make things more or less dramatic, but that's, that's built in, you know, that's, that's just plot structure. And then I throw the characters into it and, and make them climb over all these. It's like I've built an American gladiators course and make them run it. I'm like, here, I built this terrible thing for you. Go do it. Like I built you an obstacle course, go run it. Um, do you, as the author like to add things into books that will make the reader scream what or possibly throw the book across the room that tends to happen and I didn't really mean for it to happen but let me just say it happens a lot um I have been screamed at many times for this one already and I'm I'm delighted I'm like thank you for reading all the way to the end I know you're up to the end and and for Karen do you um are you ever surprised by the things that people found most surprising or most upsetting or do you kind of know what you're doing up front a little bit, but sometimes it surprises me. But also I'm like, I kind of accept that whatever reaction people have to the book is exciting and fine. Like, I just think it's, I'm always mildly amazed that anybody's read it. You know, in my, it's, there's even after all the books, I've, I've written a whole bunch of books and I'm still, and people are like, I read your book. And there's still this little voice in my head that goes, how did you come to my house? Like, 
how did you read my story? Oh yeah, right. Like it's a book, like you can read it, but it, it never, that feeling never really goes away for me. Like the kind of amazement that other people have read what I wrote down. It also amazes me because it's not like any two people ever read the same book. So the, the amount that readers put into a book and interpretation or relating to it and everything, it's not just like, you know, thousands of people are reading the one book. It's like this one thing I wrote can become all these different things for all these different people. But that's so much why fan and YA communities build, you know, we, the authors, like we make a, a story and we hope that people like it or respond to it in some way. But then readers take it from there and make so many other things that are amazing and then really put the book out into the world and talk about it and make creative things around it and do fan art and tell their friends. And it's just and the make, most amazing thing in the world, isn't it? It truly is incredible. And I, I feel like I, I, before I wrote YA, I was cynical. And the more I write YA, the more optimistic I become, truly. Like it's made me a much more positive, like happy, optimistic person because I have seen so many YA readers and the community of YA readers. It's really, that's an actual, that is an actual positive, true thing. Yeah, that, that is amazing. There are still so many questions here. I'm trying to look to see if we have one more that can be answered in like one minute. Okay, well, here we go. Well, what, okay. What, what advice do you have for young aspiring writers? Okay, and I, thought, I think you should answer this too. But um, I think that the number one advice I always, 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 always do, mess up. Do not worry about messing up. Messing up is great. Messing up is part of it. You have to write badly in order to write well, so go and write badly. And if you're writing badly, you're like, oh no, I wrote badly. No, say yes, I wrote badly. Good day's work, job done. Writing badly is the name of the game. Everything is written badly until it's written well. And nobody just, it's, it, it's exactly like if you said, I want to play the violin. And then you just picked up a violin and you were like, oh, why can't I play it? Well, you didn't take any lessons. You didn't practice. Writing actually takes practice. And I think that people just assume that you can just write. Like it just happens. Nope. You learn it. It's a practice, learn behavior, and you do it by the same way like you practice a musical instrument, which is means you, you have to learn the steps and you sound off and weird as you find your sound. So embrace failure, embrace mistakes, embrace feeling like you're doing it all wrong. That means everything's going on to just, it, it, you're doing the right thing. Yeah, literally every day my husband comes home and he's like, how was your writing day? And I was like, awful. Oh, I worked all worst. day and everything I wrote sucked so bad. It sucks mm -hmm. so bad. And then the next day I go to it and I'm like, okay, but if I do this and this and then like, and finally I'm like, oh, it's so good, but it takes so long to get there and it feels bad. Yeah. Almost it feels, every day. It, it, you, every, every author writing every book is writing that book badly until they get it the way that they want it to be. So every book is written badly. Like, so don't, even yes. worry about it. don't get in your head about that. And my advice is actually quite similar, but it's another specific thing not to get in your own head about and not to worry about too much, um, which for me is originality. Uh, which sometimes might be a controversial position, but like, I think that people, when they first start writing or when they've been writing for a long time, greatly overestimate the importance of doing something, uh, like having an idea, a premise that hasn't mm -hmm. been done before or something else that hasn't been done before. And the, the example I always give is that like, I wrote the first inheritance games book. I revised it. It went to copy edits. I was like, boom, done. And then to celebrate, I went with my friend Rachel to see the movie Knives Out. <laughs> and I knew nothing about it. And I watched Knives Out. As I wa was watching the movie, I'm like, oh my gosh, so much of this is so familiar. It's like, you've got the house and the old rich guy and he dies and the will, even like the great grandmother and like all of this stuff. And um, the movie ends and Rachel turns to me and she says, oh my gosh, are you okay? This is like a lot like inheritance game. It was like, some people might think you totally ripped it off. I was like, am I okay? Are you kidding me? This is like the best thing that has ever happened to me mm -hmm. as a writer, because suddenly we could call it YA Knives Out. And suddenly a book that wasn't as easy to hand sell had a whole big audience waiting for it. And so what I always tell people is that like, by and large, originality isn't going to necessarily come 
from the most basic idea, right? Mm -hmm. it, it comes in execution and it comes when you're writing with your own perspective. Like, you know, like a girl falls in love with a vampire that may have been done. Don't worry if it's been done, right? Because you have never done it before. And yeah. as long as you are writing as yourself, you have things you believe, things you care about, things that are important to you to be on the page. You have your own voice. That's what's going to make it original. So you don't need to worry, you know, like if someone out there just sold a book that sounds vaguely similar to what you're doing, or if you had this idea you wanted to write, and then you discovered there's already a movie like that. Like you don't have to do something that's never been done before. You just have to do it your way. Yeah, the books is people always say things like, oh, I have an idea for a book. I just have to write it. I'm like, well, you've stumbled on the hard part because premises are a dime a dozen, truly. Like the book, the hard part of book is book. <laughs> like <laughs> like the, the book part is the book part. The book part is the telling the actual for like just the story and the way it's told. So yeah. What so if you're that? sitting there thinking my idea isn't original and my writing is bad, that's normal. <laughs> like don't don't psych yourself out about that. And oh, Jennifer and Maureen, uh, we've hit the one hour mark. Uh, I want to um, thank you both for being so, so generous uh, with your time and uh, just giving us a wonderful conversation. Uh, there's about a hundred people in the chat uh, thanking you. And I'm sure there's a couple other hundred uh, watching right now who thank you as well. Let's give Maureen and Jennifer a big virtual round of applause. Uh, for those who are watching live, uh, look for an email for me tomorrow. Uh, with a link to this recording, uh, a link to Wellesley Books to purchase copies of Maureen and Jennifer's latest uh, latest works. And also, I will thank all 70 libraries and a few other folks uh, in that email tomorrow. So look for that tomorrow. Uh, Maureen and Jennifer, any last words before we uh, wrap up? Just thank you all for coming. It was amazing that you came out by 29 copies of the Inheritance Game Trilogy because Jen is the best. <laughs> I don't even have a copy with me, so, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you all uh, so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys uh, the rest of their, their evening. So thank you all. Have a great night. You all Thanks, Jennifer. Good night.